Our keynote speaker this morning is Dr. Michael Fiore. Hey, uh, Dr. Fiore, I'm um, giving you the reins here, but we have Dr. Fiore, who is the director of the Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention and professor of medicine at the University of Wisconsin, and so, so, so much more. Please uh, look at the bios that we sent so that you can get more information about our speakers. Um, and so, uh, Dr. Fiore, if you want to tell us some more about yourself, feel welcome to do so, or go ahead and start. Well, morning, everybody. It's great to be here um, and to be talking with so many people from California and beyond regarding tobacco cessation. Um, you know, when I think about states that have made a fundamental difference in how we help people to quit smoking, um, really no state has led the way and done more than the state of California. So I'm honored to be here with you today. Um, I'm gonna dive right in um, and start with just a big picture overview of what I wanna do over the next few moments. I wanna highlight a surprising population of patients who smoke who have been left behind, and that is cancer patients. I want to then describe a concerted effort by the National Cancer Institute to meet this um, unmet need, the Moonshot Funded Cancer Center Cessation Initiative, referred to as C3I. And then I want to end with a 2021 update on clinical tobacco cessation, focusing on lessons learned from C3I and more broadly. So with that, uh, I have no conflicts to report. Here is um, an overview of my talk. And I'm gonna start a little bit with the epidemiology of smoking and cancer. And as I think back on the last 75 years, and um, the seminal public health achievements of that time, nothing in my view has a greater impact on improving the health of Americans than the success we've had in reducing tobacco use rates from um, about 43% in the 1950s to somewhere around 14% today. Um, a concerted effort that collectively has dramatically decreased tobacco use rates in our country. When we look at California, as I know you all know well, um, California is doing even better uh, with adult smoking rates around 11% um, and um, high school smoking rates um, measured as in the last 30 days at about 5% versus about 9% for um, the US population. So again, California leading the way. When we look at um, e-cigarette and smokeless tobacco use, these are data from a couple years ago. Um, overall, adults in the United States, about 3% of them uh, use e-cigarettes, about 2% uh, use smokeless tobacco products about 3% of adults in tobacco use e-cigarettes and 2% uh, of adults in California use smokeless products. So you're doing better in those parameters as well. Um, all of these data point to the fact that we're making success in reducing uh, tobacco use rates and it's reflected among smokers. Today, about 70% of smokers tell us they wanna quit over 50% say they um, have tried in the last year. And we're now in a situation where um, over 60% of people who have ever smoked have now quit. So this is uh, highlighting again, this success story of reducing tobacco use. But in fact, um, we still have in the US, even at 14%, over 34 million adults who smoke. And one of the tragedies of smoking in 2021 is I know you know well 
is that smoking has moved from um, what I often refer to as an equal opportunity killer back in um, the last century to now a chronic disease of the most disadvantaged members of our society. Um, in particular, people of low education, people um, who have serious psychiatric um, and substance abuse disorders, low-income individuals, individuals who are suffering and struggling um, the most in our society continue to smoke at the highest rates. And that then in this new century provides a framework for us of where we have to go. And already hearing the efforts that you're doing in California highlight that you're doing that and your efforts in uh, partnering with health um, delivery systems where uh, so many smokers visit every year is a wonderful way to do that. And I know you'll hear more about that later today. I highlighted some of the populations that smoke at higher rates and surprisingly, that includes cancer patients. We know, for example, that about 30% of all cancer mortality represented about 180 cancer deaths per year in the US are caused by smoking. I often say um, we, we have such an effort in our country around coming up with a cure of cancer. And the tragedy for me is that we already have a cure for 30% of cancer deaths, and that is to eliminate smoking. And if we did more in that arena, um, we could profoundly impact rates of cancer deaths. By reducing smoking, we can reduce cancer incidence as well as cancer mortality. And the newest data that I'd like to highlight now talks about the particularly negative effects of continuing to smoke um, after you've got a cancer diagnosis. We know, for example, if a patient is diagnosed with cancer and she continues to smoke, her all-cause mortality will be increased by 50%. Her cancer-related mortality by 60%. She's at greater risk for a second primary. And if we help that individual to quit, her likelihood of overcoming cancer improves dramatically. We also know that um, cancer um, recurrence is at a higher rate among smokers who continue to smoke, that cancer patients who smoke have a poorer response to treatment. And one really important factor is they have greater cancer-related uh, toxicity. All of these data are from the 2014 uh, 50th Anniversary Surgeon General's report. And I wanted to highlight these because these data in particular appear to motivate both oncologists as well as cancer patients who might not think about intervening for smoking cessation otherwise, but might in the face of these uh, data. If a patient continues to smoke after a cancer diagnosis, um, their um, oncology healthcare costs are about $10,000 greater. So it's also an expensive endeavor. Taken together, these data, in my view, make a compelling case for viewing tobacco cessation as essential a component of oncology clear as radiation surgery and chemotherapy, leading us to designate um, smoking cessation as the fourth pillar of cancer care along with radiation chemotherapy in surgery. And that framing of smoking cessation as a treatment intervention as important as these other core components of cancer care really put smoking cessation in a different light for oncology care. Unfortunately, it's been a missed opportunity. Um, this uh, somewhat dated survey from 2009 found that only 38% of cancer centers recorded um, smoking as a vital sign. So patients are going into cancer centers and they're not even asking them if they smoke. 
and cancer care providers said that smoking cessation was not perceived as a core component of general cancer care. All of this um, identified a series of things that need to be done um, using EHR technology and clinical trial procedures to consistently identify um, uh, and provide cessation treatment for oncology patients to deal with these organizational barriers in cancer um, treatment that address tobacco cessation and fundamentally achieve institutional buy-in that tobacco treatment needs to be part of the standard of oncology care, uh, something that it hasn't been until this time. In response to this unmet need, the economic costs, the toxic implications of continued smoking in 2017, the National Cancer Institute established the Cancer Center Initiative, C3I, and that was part of the Moonshot funding. And I want to describe now in some detail C3I, uh, both as a model of oncology care, but also the, for the lessons that it provides to helping people quit smoking in general. Uh, we describe this in detail in the New England Journal of Medicine perspective um, in that focused on addressing this core gap in cancer care. So C3I has as its short-term goals to develop and expand the capacity of the 70 NCI designated cancer centers so that they could better treat tobacco use. But the big picture goal was to change cancer care and cancer centers so that tobacco cessation treatment um, extends beyond the limited funding provided by C3I. So over the last three years, NCI has uh, provided funding for 52 of the 70 um, NCI designated cancer centers. That was over three cohorts. And they asked us at the University of Wisconsin to serve as the coordinating center for this initiative. So what do the are these 52 cancer centers asked to do with the very modest funding that they're provided. Uh, they have to develop um, treatment for tobacco dependence plans, touching every oncology patient in the ideal. They were given two years uh, to do this with the exception of the uh, last cohort. Um, they were provided support uh, for staff building uh, and for hiring staff. Um, they were um, helped in integrating tobacco treatment um, into cancer care workflows, EHR support to integrate it into the electronic health record um, and help with patient services. Um, we have twice a year grantee meetings um, and they were asked to sustain the program for at least uh, two years after NCI funding. So uh, it has to be sustainable. Fundamentally, our goal was to increase the reach, effectiveness, and sustainability of smoking cessation treatment in cancer centers across uh, the United States. They were asked to take a population-based approach, essentially touching every cancer patient that smokes. All of the centers aren't doing that um, in full, but they're all working towards that goal. And again, the idea is to deliver a dose of smoking cessation treatment to every oncology patient visiting these um, NCI designated cancer centers who smoke. They report twice annually on reach effectiveness and program characteristics. And this allows us to then study these 52 sites to see what factors of them appear to increase um, their effectiveness in which are less so. We at the University of Wisconsin coordinating centers are in service to the grantees providing scientific and technical assistance. Um, we're a hub of knowledge sharing information across all of the 52 sites. We develop, collect and evaluate um, data 
we run the twice annual um, grantee meetings and webinars, and we've been charged with compiling lessons learned, best practices and model programs, because in the ideal, C3I will not just be a program for the 52 um, NCI designated cancer centers, but will influence oncology care nationwide, such that the new standard of care will be that every oncology patient who presents for cancer care has as part of that care, the identification of their tobacco use and tobacco cessation treatment. This map shows you the uh, 52 um, cancer centers. And as you can see, they're across the nation. And one other point I'd like to make a, a, about them, NCI was, I think, really um, insightful in selecting not just cancer centers that already had done a lot with smoking cessation, but we identified some sites that had done nothing um, so that we can work from the ground up and really um, come up with effective programs to help cancer patients to quit. Um, the first uh, cohort uh, came on in September of 2017, um, and the last cohort um, it just began in September of 2020. Importantly, we've asked all 52 of the sites to continue as part of a consortium that will work on this effort um, into the future. And I'm really pleased that uh, they've all agreed to participate in that way. California's had a prominent um, role in C3I and I wanna give a shout out to the six funded uh, C3I programs, UC Davis, UC San Francisco, Stanford, City of Hope, uh, USC and UC San Diego. And it's great to see so many of you from those programs uh, on the webinar today. Some of the common um, um, successes and challenges that the programs have had in building in many instances, a ground up cessation plan. Um, we've got work plans in all of them. Um, staff have been hired. Um, very detailed workflow analyses have been conducted. And, and a lot of the work that I've been involved in over the last 30 years has been around this issue of how you institutionalize smoking cessation treatment into clinical care and recognizing that this has to be layered on and integrated into existing clinical workflows is so key. And um, doing these workflows analyses, I think, are something that all of us can do in our clinical settings in order to better recognize and understand and integrate um, tobacco cessation treatments. This work takes time uh, among the challenges they faced. Um, adjusting the electronic health record is a lengthy and painful process for anyone who's gone through it. Um, there are so many IT priorities um, and something as simple as clinic space for smoking cessation in an oncology setting proved to be a significant barrier. But we've had success. Um, this slide is showing the hiring of staff. This is for the first of the three cohorts. And as you can see, um, um, staff uh, were hired um, almost universally. Um, the programs, um, this is showing uh, the first cohort with their progress over three years. And across the board, they've implemented more and more treatment components. Importantly, all of the treatment components are evidence-based. We're not testing evidence-based treatment programs in C3I. We're implementing them and we're evaluating how to implement them uh, most effectively. Um, a couple other key challenges and, and solutions that we've adopted. Um, the people who apply for grants typically are researchers with limited understanding of clinic workflows and clinic organization and decision making. Um, and they often bumped up against um, 
the clinic um, organizational structure. So we spent a lot of time training these researchers in how you can influence change within clinic settings. Um, EHR modifications are an enormous mountain to climb. So we hired a EHR consultant to work one-on-one -on -one with each site, not the researchers specifically, although they were at the table, but the IT teams who have to implement the EHR changes so that we could help them to do that most effectively. I'm really pleased that we've not only showed progress over year to year across the sites, but we did a good job in reaching some of the underserved populations. For example, um, African Americans who visited these programs uh, received um, um, treatment. They were reached by some component of treatment actually at a greater rate than whites. Um, and we've worked hard to reach all populations, but make sure that underserved populations who visit cancer centers were not left behind. And we had a particular emphasis on Spanish speaking um, individuals because so often um, ancillary services and cancer centers are not adapted to Hispanic speaking patients. Looking forward, our goal is to move beyond the 52 current NCI designated cancer centers to reach all 70 of them. But as I mentioned earlier, the broader goal is to influence oncology care broadly. Um, we know um, that um, a minority of cancer patients get their care in an NCI designated cancer center. So we need to uh, provide lessons learned, best practices and model programs to community cancer delivery systems um, across the nation. And we're in the process of doing that. Some um, implications and takeaways from C3I. Every cancer patient, just as every patient who visits an el a healthcare delivery system should receive treatment for their tobacco dependence if they smoke. Um, a variety of modalities uh, can deliver this and in C3I, we didn't have a prescriptive way to help cancer patients quit. Rather, we said there's a menu of evidence-based options. You take the ones that work best for you and prove to us that you're making a difference. Um, treatments that are effective for smokers in general um, appear to be very effective for cancer patients. And this is a really important point, I think, for all of us who work in cessation. Um, do we need to have individually tested and proved cancer, um, I'm sorry, tobacco cessation programs for every subpopulation? The evidence suggests we don't. Of course, we need to be culturally um, sensitive. And of course, we need to address language issues. But we've got an extraordinary body of smoking cessation evidence that we need to implement uh, today. And as I um, alluded to earlier, this idea of thinking about smoking cessation and oncology care is the fourth pillar of cancer care. So I'm gonna turn now and use my last few moments to go broader than just oncology patients, um, take some of the lessons learned from C3I, but also some of the more, more recent data on treatment and policy for all patients who smoke. And I'm gonna um, hit the highlights here. I know that I don't have to tell anybody on this call that tobacco dependence treatment requires coaching, it requires medication, and it requires institutional organizational changes so that we bake in workflows that address tobacco use with every patient at every visit. I sometimes think about it um, as we have to change the architecture of, can of, of uh, clinical care in order to better integrate smoking cessation. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk now about some of the innovation, some 
um, of the findings and particularly since the last um, public health service guideline update that allows us to be more effective with our um, patients in general who smoke. And I'm gonna start with the power of combining both counseling and medicine. We know from the guideline and it's been reinforced since that counseling by itself is effective, medications by themselves are effective, but when we combine the two, there are additive effects. So if we wanna give a patient the best likelihood of succeeding, we wanna provide both. Here's the meta-analysis from the 2008 guideline. Um, as you see, this, com this compares counseling alone with adding um, medication to counseling. We had nine studies to review. And by adding medication, if you look at the odds ratio column here, we boost cessation rates in a statistically significant way by about 70%. But the good news is the converse is also true, that if we add counseling to medication alone, we boost uh, long-term cessation by about 40%. I'm often uh, speaking to clinicians. And when I tell them there's seven medications uh, for smoking cessation, their eyes sometimes glaze over. And what the good news is in terms of communicating to our clinical audiences are that there are two treatments that in particular are effective relative to the others. They are varenicline in combination nicotine replacement therapy, in particular the patch with the nicotine mini lozenge. These two are more effective than um, what they were compared to, which is the patch by itself in a statistically significant way. So we could tell clinicians now that there are a lot of effective medicines, but if you wanna really help your patients the most, focus on the two most effective, varenicline or combination nicotine replacement therapy. Um, California is the model for quit lines. You've done it um, for decades, um, but we view quit lines as a treatment extender. And I think that's an important message for clinicians that um, a referral to a quit line doesn't give the clinical audience a pass to ignore the fact that their patients smoke. We view it as a, sub, a supplement to um, clinical care for smoking rather than a substitute. And there's powerful evidence that quit lines are effective. This is the guideline meta-analysis saying relative to minimal or self-help counseling, quit lines boosted long-term cessation rates by 60%. And quit lines added to medication in a statistically significant way, boost quit rates by about 30%. So powerful evidence that quit lines are effective by themselves and they also boost medication use. Um, Eliza Tong, Dr. Tong, and so many others in um, California are leaders in the use of um, e-referral or electronic health record referral um, in a closed loop way to quit lines. We've done work on that topic as well here in Wisconsin. Um, and it's a great way to integrate quit lines into clinical care. Um, another innovation in cessation is pre-use, pre-quit use of NRT. Um, and in particular at our site, we use the patch primarily uh, but the nicotine mini lozenge can be done as well. There are powerful data and the guideline um, showed this, that even if your patient is not willing to quit now, putting them on nicotine replacement therapy markedly enhances the likelihood that they'll decrease or quit their smoking by 250% in fact. Um, so we have now integrated that, this into our clinical care, that if the patient says, you know, doc, I'm just not ready to make a quit attempt now, we put them on nicotine replacement therapy and say, 
let's try this for a couple months and, and I'll check in with you once a month and see how you're doing. Many of them then transition and say, you know, the nicotine let me realize that if I'm controlling my urges to smoke, I'm, I'm feeling more empowered to quit and many do. Long-term use of NRT, the data here is more mixed, but there is some data that say extending um, nicotine medicines at least um, beyond eight weeks to um, 26 weeks in a statistically significant way can boost quit rates. Um, E-health and M-health is a really powerful potential to reach uh, very large numbers of patients. Um, I often think of e-health and m-health as broad but not deep um, and the data it is frankly mixed on their effectiveness but they are tools that people use and we should integrate them into our care including um, using EHR modifications that allow the clinician to more systematically address tobacco use. This is some screenshots from Epic um, that um, make the um, counseling as well as the medication prescribing a little bit easier. Um, many of you know the NCI's suite of services called smokefree.gov. I'd urge you to take a look at it in part because it's the most um, widely used um, um, web-based set of programs for smoking cessation, but it also has um, a series of programs that are targeting very particular populations. So take a look at smokefree.gov. If I'm talking about smoking cessation, I'd be remiss to not mention um, e-cigarettes. Um, E-cigarettes is a incredibly complicated, challenging issue and one that is unfortunately um, caused um, um, very mixed perspectives on the part of people working in tobacco control and smoking cessation. Um, if I were to summarize the data, I'd say that um, there's limited data um, on um, health risk, particularly long-term health risks, but I think it's unequivocal that e-cigarettes are substantially less dangerous than combustible tobacco use. Um, the biggest concern is around youth and a clear unequivocal message that no one disagrees with is no one, um, no uh, youth, no adolescents, ideally no young adults should be using um, any nicotine containing product because of um, brain changes associated with that. Um, uh, the biggest problem with e-cigarettes from my perspective in America is they're not used as a substitute for smoking. They're used in a dual use way. Um, we have a Evali, which probably wasn't related to the e-cigarettes, but it's additives. And we have the issue of secondhand uh, vapor exposure. So what I say to clinicians who ask me, we have a series of evidence-based treatments. Use those first, um, urge your patients to use them. Um, and um, if the patient says that even after this, they're gonna use e-cigarettes to focus on the don't use dual use, um, use it for a, and use it for a limited period of time as a bridge from smoking combustibles to using no nicotine or tobacco product. Um, we were asked by the New England Journal of Medicine to summarize this and we did that in a um, 2014 um, perspective. Um, I would be remiss not to um, talk about the fact that so much of tobacco cessation is prompted by policy taxes are so powerful, increasing price, making indoor environments smoke free and half of America unfortunately still lives in states where there are not um, workplace smoke free ordinances. Media campaigns in, including the TIPS campaign and the FDA campaigns have been very powerful. The Affordable Care Act and meaningful use prompt tobacco cessation. And the thing from my perspective 
the biggest missed opportunity in America since 2009 has been the lack of implementing uh, the legislatively uh, provided authority in the Tobacco Control Act of 2009 that allows the FDA to reduce the nicotine content of cigarettes to near zero non-addictive levels. That one act, it's been modeled, will reduce tobacco use rates to well below 5% of Americans because people typically do not smoke denicotinized cigarettes. I'm going to end by uh, the topic of our day today, um, and that is COVID and smoking. Um, we um, have, um, as a society, as a nation, as a world, have suffered from this pandemic. And among the many tragedies of COVID is the fact that those who smoke and this is, um, has also been highlighted by uh, some California researchers, those who smoke are at markedly greater risk of COVID-related complications, including intubation and death. So helping people quit smoking, as you'll talk about more later today, not only <clears throat> improves all of the smoking-related causes, but also if the individual develops COVID, will um, help to prevent them from having this, the very serious consequences that so many people um, suffered from as a result of COVID. You know, um, we have the vaccines that are coming online. In the 1950s, um, a similar epidemic of polio um, resulted in the production of a vaccine. And um, during that time, um, um, uh, we um, vaccinated a whole generation of young Americans. Little did we know that as we were overcoming the epidemic of polio in America, we were launching an epidemic of tobacco use. Um, we're now in the process of overcoming the epidemic of COVID. We need to redouble our efforts in overcoming the epidemic of tobacco use and the work that you're getting together for today uh, to identify effective ways to help people to quit um, is um, such good work and will help towards that goal. Thanks for inviting me here today um, and you have a, a great conference um, bringing together folks from across California and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Dr. Freeman, we want to take a couple of minutes for, uh, we got quite a bit of chat going on in the chat room here. Um, Dr. Fiore, do you want to address a little bit about pregnancy and um, smoking and smoking cessation? Sure. Um, so there's probably not a population for whom the benefits of cessation are greater than pregnant women. Um, um, so there are substantial complications to the woman and the fetus is put at substantial risk as a result of smoking. Um, <clears throat> we know um, that if women quit any time during pregnancy, the pregnancy outcomes are improved, but it's particularly beneficial earlier in pregnancy. Counseling is effective and um, pregnant women uh, particularly benefit from more intensive counseling. Two additional points I'd make about pregnant women and cessation. One is because of the stigma of smoking during pregnancy, um, pregnant women um, misreport their smoking use at a higher rate than most other populations. Uh, so be sensitive to that and recognize and as we communicate to them that um, uh, pregnant women are incredibly, um, feel incredibly badly often uh, by their smoking. The last point, which is always such a controversial one, is medication use during pregnancy for women who smoke. Uh, the 2008 PHS guideline said that the evidence um, was not substantial enough to recommend it, and there were some um, concerns about safety and medication. Without a question, smoking is more dangerous, uh, but it did not rise to the level that the PHS guideline can endorse it. 
uh, the Society for Obstetrics and Gynecology has endorsed the use of nicotine in low doses for pregnant women. Great. There was another question um, about smoking in youth, those under 18. Is there um, any specific strategy or medicines you would recommend for those that are under 18? So for um, adolescents, um, a, a couple messages I'd say. Um, most everything we've tried for adolescent cessation um, has unfortunately been um, minimally uh, successful or not successful. Adolescents are very uh, sensitive to policy implications. So I would focus my efforts on the policy side with adolescents, raising price. They're more price sensitive than adults. Uh, the the uh, campaigns of the FDA that have really focused on adolescents um, are, um, are really helpful access issues um, are really important. Um, and counseling appears important as well, um, although not to the effect that it is with adults. Um, this is the second population that the PHS guideline did not endorse medicine because frankly, there were not data to endorse that. Um, I would focus my efforts on um, price policies, um, public service campaigns um, and and um, and if the patient says um, they uh, would like to try medication um, clinically I do this all the time um, a big problem with adolescents as we all know is sticking with um, um, approaches including uh, smoking cessation medications I'll stop there on that one Great, thank you. I will close with one final question about use of marijuana, smoking marijuana to, for uh, cancer patients with pain. Should they use edibles or tinctures instead? Should we? Should you try to still discourage marijuana smoking? Um, and um, yeah, so that's basically the question. Yeah. So I'm not an <clears throat> I'm not an expert on marijuana, but I'll I'll give some perspective on it real quickly. Um, First of all, if, if a patient is at the end of their life and are struggling with significant cancer pain, um, my feeling as a person and as a clinician is that they should use anything they want or they can to mitigate that suffering. Um, we know though that uh, for end of life for cancer patients, um, shortness of breath is is and uh, wheezing dyspnea are some of the um, most powerful and most unpleasant aspects of um, end of life. Thus, um, anything that worsens breathing capacity, um, if the patient can tolerate without it, they should not do it only because it will make their suffering less. Thus, if they get the same effect by edibles, versus um, uh, combusting uh, marijuana, I would urge that, yes. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Fiore. It was a brilliant, um, very insightful presentation and we look forward to having um, to working with you and to having you back for future symposiums. Great, uh, great job, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye everybody. Yes, thank you.